Apparently, Ethiopian baboons are starting to domesticate wolves, which is giving scientists new insights about what it might have been like when early humans did that. That's pretty cool. Not quite as cool as we thought, scream scientists, as baboons riding wolves come pouring out of the forest. That's ridiculous. During the winter of 2006 on the Gausa Plain of Ethiopia, a team of researchers studying the interactions between gelada monkeys and large carnivores began to realise their data was showing increasing evidence of something that shouldn't really be happening. As expected, the baboons fled or cried alarm at the sight of potential predators such as humans, feral dogs and even servals with those unfortunate enough ending up as fast food. Yet, despite this constant predation, two species were openly tolerated by the geladas, African and Ethiopian wolves. For some reason, both species seemed to have struck up a sort of truce with the primates, with almost no aggression exhibited. But why? What's the evolutionary benefit of ignoring a food source that's practically under your nose? That's more or less the question the researchers were asking themselves, and being scientists, they decided to answer that question. But first, let's spend a few minutes getting to know these three species a little better. There are a lot of wild canids with pointy snoots, pointy teeth, and similarly shaped toe beans that we often call wolves. But when we go down to the genetic level, some of these wolves are actually only distantly related to the familiar grey wolf, Anus lupus. Both the African and Ethiopian wolf, our wolf of the day, aka Canis semensis, are examples of this. They are thought to have evolved, or speciated, from a common ancestor millions of years before the grey wolf even existed. Since that time, all three have followed a similar evolutionary trajectory, looking very much like wolves, but still being their own distinct species. While African wolves are more closely related to jackals, Ethiopian wolf would feel a little bit more at home next to grey wolves and coyotes if there was a family reunion of canids. Wait a moment there. Yes, coyote? Did you know there's a new channel starting up with the same mission as this one, with a focus on coyotes? It's called Coyote Awareness, and I've snuck their Instagram handle in the description. Go check them out. Okay, back to you. Okay, well I'll let you hang around at the end to tell people about it then. It may come as no surprise to find out that geladas are also not considered wolves. And despite being referred to as baboons a lot of the time, they aren't that either. Superficially, they tick all of the boxes. They have long snoots and shaggy fur, and form social groups up to 600 strong. If any primate experts among you would like to explain exactly why they are not categorised as baboons, please do, but I'm going to assume that being the last survivors of an ancient genus, it might have something to do once again with convergent evolution. The important thing to know from all of this is that gelada monkeys and Ethiopian wolves occupy ranges that overlap, and that means the highlands in which they are both found permit some unique interactions. And this is where we return to the Gausa Plateau. Over a two-year period, the team managed to record 80 encounters between geladas and wolves, and 10 encounters with feral dogs. The difference in these interactions was undeniable. When feral dogs approached, the monkeys would call an alarm and flee up to 300 meters or more. In fact, three of them were even caught and eaten by the dogs, despite such a small sample size. However, when wolves were present, the geladas only even bothered to move about 30% of the time, and even then only to stop a few meters away. While the dogs hunted the monkeys in packs of up to three, almost all of the wolves were alone, 
and instead spent their time around the monkeys foraging for small prey in the undergrowth, seemingly using the monkeys' grazing noise as a sort of acoustic camouflage. When the scientists observed their success rate, they found that hunting alone yielded a 25% chance of success, but when geladas were nearby, that shot up to almost 67%. This didn't appear to be random either. The wolves actively chose to hunt in and around the geladas. In the eight years the study eventually ran for, only one young wolf attempted to catch a juvenile gelada, which it dropped unharmed as it was instantly mobbed by dozens of adult monkeys which sounds absolutely terrifying. The scientists concluded that the majority of wolves must be exhibiting non-threatening behavior towards geladas because foraging for unearthed rodents among them was far more beneficial than simply hunting the monkeys. With the wolves presenting no real risk, over time the geladas had become habituated to and extremely tolerant of their presence. Now, this is a remarkable relationship that still isn't fully understood, but the researchers suggest it may be commensal or perhaps weakly parasitic, since the wolves don't really seem to be giving anything back to the geladas. And yet, it feels a far cry away from domestication. I mean, neither of these species has even put up a fence around the other yet. It, it took me a while to find out where the sensationalism around this paper started, and after a lot of doing this, I think ultimately Business Insider was to blame when it sort of misquoted New Scientist's article on the study entitled, Monkey's Cozy Alliance with Wolves Looks Like Domestication. For their article, New Scientist interviewed a guy named Claudia Solero, who studies Ethiopian wolves, and he told them that the situation is comparable to what early domestication of dogs might have looked like. Two important points here. This person wasn't one of the authors of the study, as Business Insider attributed him, and we also don't know how wolves became domesticated. As Business Insider conveniently failed to mention. Humans' domestication of wolves is a rabbit hole we are not going down. Not today anyway. But here's what you need to know about domestication when it comes to wolves and gelada monkeys. First off, taming conditions an individual wild animal's behaviour to make it more tolerant of humans, or in this case monkeys. But when that tamed animal reproduces, its offspring are still going to be wild. Domestication, however, breeds the most docile of these offspring over multiple generations, resulting in genetic changes of behavioural and physical characteristics. Oh god, no, we've gone too far. By ensuring that only the least aggressive wolves were allowed to hunt around them, geladas are creating a similar condition to what our own ancestors likely did with grey wolves. Over multiple generations, there's a chance that the Ethiopian wolves of the Gausa Plateau might speciate slightly and deepen the ecological relationship between themselves and the primates. Though, unless the monkeys start deriving some sort of benefit for themselves, it's unlikely to look anything like domestication. Unfortunately, this is something we might never get a chance to see. As I've mentioned, domestication takes a lot of time, and that's something that Ethiopian wolves and gelada monkeys don't have. There are currently between 340 and 400 members of Canis semensis in the wild today, making them one of the most endangered canids. There are so many threats to their survival. Canine distemper and rabies epizootics are also exacerbating this decline in numbers, with a 30% decrease in population since 2008, and one enclave becoming extinct in the last decade. Even worse, the individual populations are so small and fragmented, largely from intensive agriculture, that current inbreeding among them could spell the end for this fascinating animal. 
It's not a much better story for Geladas. Habitat loss due to farming and continued eradication efforts by humans over resource competition are pushing these monkeys further and further away from suitable habitat and from the territories that overlap with the wolves. In the words of Vivek Venkataraman, hope I've got your name right, who was interviewed in an article by Scientific American, I believe these interactions between geladas and wolves were once more widespread and common, as the historical range of these species was larger. In that sense, it's a vanishing behaviour. I think it's too uncommon now to find populations of wolves and geladas that overlap, and are habituated to the presence of people and researchers. If we can protect or even help restore Canis semensis, we might just get an invaluable look back through the millennia at the very beginning of our own relationship with house wolves. That's why I put way too much effort into this video's thumbnail, because it's now available as a desktop background, which you can download and support work to safeguard Canis semensis as a part of our annual donations. Prices start at 75 pence, that's around one US dollar, or you can pay a little extra to have a physical copy delivered to you. Of course, anything else you might find in my store also helps keep wolves in the wild where they belong, so Go on and be a part of the next chapter of this story. Okay, you've made it to the end of the video. Thank you so much for staying this long. I can only apologize at how long I've spent in uploading this. There's just been a lot going on this year, but I think I've got things under control at the moment. So next video should be uploaded a little bit sooner. Until then, just remember, understand, coexist, and evolve. I'll see you then.